Hello and welcome to ABC News, I'm Matthew Doran. Our top stories this hour. Sydney's lockdown extended until the end of the month as New South Wales records 97 new COVID cases. Seven new cases in Victoria linked to COVID positive removalists who travelled from New South Wales. Charges dropped against the Queensland woman accused of contaminating strawberries with needles. And Australia's military closely tracking a Chinese spy ship as it makes its way towards Queensland to monitor large-scale military exercises. Lockdown restrictions in Greater Sydney will be extended for at least another fortnight, with the New South Wales Premier warning it could remain in place even longer. It gives the state until 11.59pm on Friday the 30th of July to contain the outbreak in Greater Sydney. 97 new locally acquired COVID cases have been recorded. At least 24 were in the community for their entire infectious period. Seven were isolated for part of it. And the status of a further six cases is still being determined. So that means up to 37 people were infectious in the community at some point. Now, of the cases reported today, 70 are from southwestern Sydney. And of course, that remains the area of greatest concern for health authorities. 14 are from southeastern Sydney five from the inner parts of the city, four in western Sydney, two in northern Sydney, and there are a further two cases further afield in the Blue Mountains region. For more on Sydney's lockdown, I spoke to reporter Tim Swanston from Fairfield in the city's southwest. Just shy of 100 cases, which is, of course, a concern to health authorities at this stage. But even more of a concern is that we're still seeing a high number of cases that are infectious in the community uh, while they are, uh, you know, going about their business, that sort of thing. And, and here in the southwest of Sydney in Fairfield is certainly the greatest area of concern. So of today's 97 cases, as you said, about three quarters of those are in the southwestern health district. We understand that the majority of those are in the Fairfield area. And uh, some 24 people were infectious in the community. We are seeing very high rates of testing, though. There were some 65,000 tests conducted in the last 24 hours or so, and much of that is evidenced here in Fairfield. There were some extraordinarily large testing lines here in Fairfield last night, partially to do with that new advice that's come out from health authorities for essential workers in the area to be tested uh, sort of uh, every three days if they're leaving the Fairfield area to go about their essential work. Now, we did hear, though, because those case numbers aren't promising, that the lockdown will be extended for another fortnight. And the Premier announced that he said essentially with regret that it was, of course, uh, quite harmful to individuals and to businesses. Um, but ultimately, she said that it was necessary to try and curb the spread at this stage of the virus. Let's take a listen. I want to thank the community for your patience. But please also know this is why the New South Wales Treasurer, Don Perrottet, who's with me today, and I fought so hard to get the right package for New South Wales and why we've provided additional funding so that businesses and individuals don't stress. For as long as we need to make sure we keep our public health and safe, uh, individuals or businesses will remain well supported. Of course, we want to see this lockdown end in a timely way. But no matter um, how long we do need, we will have that support for businesses and for individuals. Gladys Berejiklian, in the New South Wales Premier there. Now, Tim, most of the cases reported today were again in Fairfield, where you are. What did the Chief Health Officer have to say about that? Well, certainly the local community was praised. They say that based on movement data in the area, they can tell that most people are abiding by the stay-at-home orders. But it's not just Fairfield that's on high alert. There are other areas around in southwestern Sydney, so notably Canterbury, Bankstown, as well as further southwest into Liverpool, that are also on high alert and, and should be alarmed uh, at the uh, community transmission at the moment. So she said, though, that looking at that movement data, it's still quite clear that there's a lot of activity going on in those local government areas, and she did want people to make sure that they're heeding the advice from health authorities. There were a number of other areas of concern that she certainly mentioned by now. So those are Roselands, Rosebury, Belmore, Sutherland Shire, the St George area, Windsor, St Ives, Henrith and the Bayside local government area. So it's certainly not just out isolated to the southwest. And uh, the Chief Health Officer, Dr Kerry Chant, said that, of course, while Fairfield is of concern, she does want everyone in Greater Sydney to be on alert. Whilst we are intensively focusing on supporting the communities in Fairfield to identify cases and to stop spread in that 
a local government area to keep that community safe, it is important that we don't keep, lose focus on adjacent local government areas of Liverpool and also the Canterbury Bankstown local government areas, but also broader greater metropolitan Sydney. New South Wales Chief Health Officer Kerry Chant there. Now, Tim, there's been a lot of frustration at the long lines for testing in Fairfield. We saw some remarkable vision from the ABC chopper last night of headlights streaming down roads for kilometres and kilometres. Uh, how uh, are the authorities responding to that? Yeah, look, it was fairly extraordinary vision seeing those testing lines and uh, frustration is probably putting it mildly at this stage. There are a lot of people who are very, very cross at, uh, you know, the current situation to do with testing. Of course, that uh, messaging did come through yesterday that uh, meant that essential workers, if they're travelling outside the LGA, need to get tested every three days. But we did hear uh, essentially an apology as well this morning uh, to residents in Fairfield because it's clear that the testing capability uh, just wasn't enough to try and process people quickly and smoothly. Here at one of the drive-through clinics, this is a 24-hour clinic, the lines have just been quite extraordinary. And a lot of people are quite frustrated that there's not enough walk-in clinics as well to be able to go to. And of course, as I'm sure you can appreciate in this area, a lot of people don't drive. And that uh, walk-in capability is something as well that's been brought into question. So we did hear from the Premier today that they were trying to increase testing capability across South West Sydney and in Fairfield, and they're trying to mitigate uh, strategies as well. We did hear from New South Wales Police's Gary Warboys that uh, police have been trying to do their best to ensure that people are able to get tested in an orderly way. New South Wales Police uh, deployed additional resources to that area uh, for the one reason, that was to help out those people, uh, to assist our, our, our friends at health, uh, to look after the people of Fairfield, uh, to provide them with some information, uh, some reassurance around uh, those queues and, uh, and the testing centres and their hours of operation. Uh, we will continue to do that right throughout today, right throughout the next few days, uh, until such times as that get some sort of sense of normality uh, about it. So 65,000 tests in the 24 hours to last night, judging by these uh, testing lines around Fairfield driving around the southwest, I'd wager that that number's going to be similar, if not higher, as the community comes out in pretty extraordinary testing numbers to try and knock the virus on the head. Tim Swanston in Fairfield there. Now, there's been some criticism of the New South Wales government for not putting tougher restrictions in place sooner. Professor of Infectious Diseases and Epidemiology at James Cook University, Emma McBride, says expecting the lockdown to be lifted in just two weeks' time is optimistic. Well, it was pretty clear that uh, one week wasn't going to be sufficient and I guess it's good that, that uh, we don't have the, the disappointment of having to say in a week's time that the lockdown's going to be extended again like it's happened in the last few weeks. So I think at least two weeks and two days is, is uh, I guess, it's a very optimistic uh, uh, mm. thought. But uh, so I, I don't going to be quite enough but we in two weeks and two days we will have an idea as to whether the epidemic tide has turned over and we're on you know a positive downward slope you know a downward slope which is positive news or whether things are uh, still out of control it's a fairly tough lockdown as it stands now but not quite as tough people are saying as the as the victorian lockdown and that's because there's no sort of five kilometer limit and 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 full curfew uh, and there's still uh, less uh, shops closed because there's uh, the definition of essential work is more, I guess, open and, and liberal. Uh, so it, I guess the question is, where are the cases occurring? Uh, are they occurring because these, uh, uh, you know, retail uh, shops are open or are they occurring because people are not obeying the, the rules that are in place? And if it's the latter, then I think the response should be, to really focus in on where the cases are occurring, what's going on, uh, and deal with them in, in, in the way that's required, messaging people to do the right thing. Whereas if they're occurring in, in small retail shops, then, then of course, maybe that, that's an indication that they need to close down uh, too. Uh, at the moment, I don't believe they're occurring because retail uh, small retail shops are open, uh, but I, you know, the, the department will have more detail on that than, than is publicly available. Obviously, in retrospect, it's easy. It should have, certainly should have been imposed earlier. I've been saying during the, you know, the last year or so, until the Delta came along, that, that we've been imposing lockdowns too soon. 
But with Delta virus, it's a different story. Uh, and also there's evidence now that says if you do close down soon, you open up soon. So uh, countries like Australia and New Zealand uh, have endured much less uh, stringency in lockdown because we've locked down soon and gone for elimination and then been able to relax. So I think that's true. I don't, I'm not a big believer in locking down just because there's one case who you don't even know if there's been a transmission yet. Uh, and that's the sort of thing we've seen sometimes in, in Queensland. Uh, but certainly as soon as there's a few mystery cases around and it's looking like there's an uptick, I think with Delta, if the aim is elimination, we just have to lock down mm. at that stage. So if it's trending down and it's below 10 in two weeks' time, then I think we can make some serious um, uh, decisions about relaxing and, and at what time. Uh, Whereas if it's uh, trending upwards and 24, then th that's certainly no time to start thinking about really relieving any uh, restrictions. Let's head further south now to Victoria, where seven new cases of coronavirus have been detected, linked to a removalist crew from Sydney and a family who'd recently returned from New South Wales. The MCG is among new exposure sites this afternoon after an infected person attended the Carlton Geelong match on the weekend. For the latest, I spoke to reporter Zalika Rismal earlier. Well, these seven new cases are in addition to a case that was announced earlier this morning. That was the fourth member of this uh, family of four uh, who has who have all now tested positive since visiting Sydney last week. Now, uh, these seven cases are all linked in some way to uh, the outbreak in New South Wales. They include a man in his 30s um, who's linked to this family of four. Uh, it's believed that he's caught the virus while at the the Coles Craigieburn. Um, it's understood that one of those family members was at that uh, that shop at the time. Uh, we've also got six cases linked to that Maribyrnong apartment complex uh, where we saw those removalists from Sydney work last week. Now, just to break down, uh, there are four people within the complex itself across two households, so a family of three, they've tested positive. Uh, there's also a man in his 60s who's tested positive. Uh, his parents, elderly parents, 89 and 90, have also tested positive. So uh, authorities are quite concerned about that man in his 60s in particular. There are already a number of exposure sites, including the MCG. Take a listen to what the COVID-19 commander, Jerome Weimar, had to say on that earlier today. The man in his 60s, we are identifying a number of exposure sites. Interviews and discussions are going on literally as we speak. At this point in time, I can confirm that one exposure site is the MCG for the Carlton Geelong game on Saturday the 10th of July between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. This individual was in level two in the MCC reserve. We currently have identified 2,000 people through the DVR code system and the ticketing systems. We've identified 2,000 people in the members reserve at the, uh, the MCC members reserve at the MCG Colton Geelong game. They all will be contacted as we speak to isolate and to get tested. So 2,000 contacts there, contact tracing interviews, of course, are currently underway with all of these new cases. And we're already seeing uh, exposure sites added uh, to the health department's website. They include, of course, that MCG game. Uh, but there's also a pub in Melbourne's CBD also on Saturday and a, a restaurant, a cake shop out in Melbourne's southeast uh, also as well. Uh, in addition to that, High Point Shopping Centre in Maribyrnong is a concern for authorities as well. But uh, uh, as we heard earlier today from uh, our COVID-19 commander, Jerome Weimar, uh, Victoria is being tested again. They've described this as a rapidly changing situation, a significant challenge, uh, but they are saying that they are hot on the heels of the virus, doing everything that they can uh, in order to contain these two chains of transmission that we've now got in the state. Uh, they were asked about restrictions. Of course, uh, we've only just really come out of a lockdown weeks ago here in Melbourne. At this stage, there are no changes to restrictions, but we do know that they move uh, very fast uh, when it comes to containing these sorts of situations. So uh, we'll see as the day progresses uh, where it takes us. Zalika, you mentioned there that the community is being tested. Given these growing numbers, what's the mood like in Melbourne? 
Uh, look, I'd be lying if I was saying no one's worried. We, we are worried, of course. Uh, uh, we know how quickly this can get out of control. And as I mentioned, we've still got restrictions, you know, indoor masks, which we hope uh, will help to contain the spread. But we, we do have uh, things are open. So, you know, thousands of people went to the football on Saturday. We've got pubs open. Uh, we're just hoping that everything can be done to bring this under control as soon as possible. Zalika Rizmal in Melbourne. Now, you would have heard Zalika mention this uh, removalist case, uh, the infections that have been linked to that. We've had some breaking news come in from our Adelaide newsroom in the last couple of minutes that authorities in South Australia are trying to pinpoint another location where those three COVID-positive removalists who had come from Sydney stopped on their way to McLaren Vale, just south of the Adelaide metro area. They've already identified two exposure sites, but say they believe that one of the men stopped somewhere else on their way into the state. So we'll bring you more on that story as it develops. Charges against a Queensland woman accused of putting needles in strawberries have been dropped. The contamination scare resulted in supermarkets pulling strawberries off the shelves and tonnes of the fruit being dumped at the peak of the growing season. Talissa Siganto reports from Brisbane. This all started in early September in 2018 when a man here in Queensland bit into a strawberry that he bought from a supermarket and discovered a sewing needle. Now, a few weeks on from then, there were reports of almost 200 of similar things being happening, uh, being found inside fruits rather. And police say that uh, this was mostly copycat incidents and it was in more than just our state. Here in Queensland, it obviously sparked a major major food safety crisis. Our Chief Health Officer, Dr Jeanette Young, at the time was telling people to throw out certain brands of strawberries if they'd bought them from supermarkets. Uh, punnets were being ripped from shelves and obviously that had a flow-on effect for growers and farmers here in Queensland and in southern states who were forced to throw out entire crops of strawberries. At the time, there was an estimated financial loss of about $160 million. It, uh, basically decimated the industry and there were a number of campaigns to try and prop up uh, the industry at the time. There were advertisements being and people being told to cut into strawberries, still buy them, but eventually it did affect dozens of uh, brands of strawberries, not just those very first ones. Uh, after a very exhaustive and long investigation about two months after the very first incident was reported, police here announced that they had actually made an arrest and it was a woman named Maya Trin who was a farm supervisor at the Berrylicious farm in Caboolture, just north of Brisbane. Now, it was alleged at the time that she put needles in strawberries over a number of months uh, as a sabotage attack, that's what they alleged, and she was charged with eight counts of contamination of goods. Well, the prosecutors didn't re reveal an exact decision uh, and we may not know uh, at any time. They may not reveal this um, moving forward. However, usually when these types of things happen, it's generally because the prosecution's case isn't strong enough or they don't believe it's going to be strong enough to get a conviction from a jury. Now, that can be for a number of reasons. It could be to do with witnesses that they might want to call. There is a lot of legislation around what evidence you're allowed to call uh, um, in front of juries. We know today that she was meant to start a four-week trial. It was actually meant to start on Monday, but it had been delayed two days because of ongoing legal argument with her lawyers and the prosecutors. This morning, when we thought it would go ahead and a jury would be empanelled, uh, the judge announced to Ms Trin that the prosecution against her had been dropped and she was free to leave court, which is exactly what she did. Outside court, her lawyer said that uh, she was relieved and she felt vindicated and thanked her supporters. The decision made by the Director of Public Prosecutions was the right decision to be made when considering all the evidence that was produced throughout the course of a very long and convoluted prosecution. Talissa Siganto with that report. Now, Australia's military is closely tracking a Chinese spy ship as it makes its way towards Queensland ahead of large-scale military exercises. The ABC's defence correspondent Andrew Green joins me now on this exclusive story. Andrew, what can you tell us about this ship? 
Matt, for several years now, the People's Liberation Army Navy have sent surveillance ships around the world to monitor military exercises, and that's what other militaries do as well. But what we've discovered is that as the biennial talisman sabre military exercises are beginning today in Queensland, a Chinese surveillance ship is making its way through the Torres Strait towards Australian waters where it's expected to monitor these exercises. As you can see from these pictures that we've obtained, it contains some fairly high-tech equipment on board, some large domes that uh, help intercept uh, radio signals that allow this surveillance aircraft to closely monitor what's going on several kilometres away on shore or above, uh, above the ocean surface. So this ship is certainly one of many high-tech surveillance ships that operate around the world every day. So, Andrew, what reaction has there been to this ship's imminent arrival? Certainly not one of surprise from people in the military or from the government, which says it's been anticipating uh, an arrival like this for some time. In fact, the Australian Defence Force has been tracking this vessel for several days. But the government is stressing today that it believes this is a reminder of China's growing influence in the region, although Australia does also conduct surveillance of exercises by other nations, what the government is stressing is that this really shows the scale that China is expanding in this region. Let's hear now from the Defence Minister, Peter Dutton, who was being particularly blunt about this surveillance ship. We've been monitoring that for some time. Uh, we uh, obviously expect uh, that they uh, operate according to international law. Uh, we would expect Nothing less if uh, we were traversing through international waters uh, close to China as well. So that will be an intelligence gathering exercise for the Chinese. The Defence Minister, Peter Dutton. Andrew Green, what can you tell us about the significance of the Talisman Sabre War Games? Every two years, this is the largest joint exercise between Australia and the United States. This is, of course, the 70th anniversary of the ANZUS Alliance, Australia's only treaty alliance with another nation. And this year, there are several nations taking part, 11 in total. Some are observing these military exercises. But for the first time, we're seeing participation from countries such as South Korea. And Peter Dutton says, uh, again, being quite blunt. In the past, we've talked uh, about this being a regional uh, mission to try to build up uh, cooperation between various states. But Peter Dutton is now squarely saying that this is partly in response to China's rise in the region. Defence correspondent Andrew Green, thank you. Thank you. A diplomatic row has broken out over the treatment of migrants trying to reach Europe from Turkey. Human rights groups allege that thousands of people seeking asylum in Europe have been blocked by Greek boats and pushed back to Turkey. The European Union is now warning Greece of the repercussions of failing to accept migrants. On Europe's southern frontier, the guardians of the law are accused of breaking it. pushing asylum seekers across an international border time and again. In some cases, shots fired in the air and into the water. All to intimidate. We've been investigating the stories of some of those who allege they've been victims of pushbacks. On June 10th last, migrants filmed part of their encounter with Greek coast guards. No water, nothing, nothing. He will die with the baby. Using the footage, we verified the date and location of the incident. They asked us why we didn't get a visa before entering. We explained that we fled the country, but there was no way to get a visa when you flee like that. With the war at home, the multiple problems, our exit is illegal. They insulted us. They made the sign of the cross. They told us to go screw ourselves, and if we came back, they would kill us. Some do manage to land in Greece. But that doesn't end the danger of being pushed back. We've heard evidence of people who've gotten ashore and been discovered by the Greek authorities, only to be taken back out to sea and pushed in the direction of Turkey without any due process. <laughs> Mina Askari. 
Then they put us on the bus and took us to a military port, then put us in boats. It was around 8 p.m. There were police wearing dark blue and commandos covering their faces with masks. I could only see the eyes. They were armed with weapons. Then we arrived at a location at around quarter past midnight. They put us all in one boat. After that, we realized we were in regional Turkish waters. Najma says they were then transferred to dinghies with no engines and allowed to drift before being eventually picked up by the Turkish Coast Guard. Since these scenes six years ago, sentiment has hardened against migrants in Europe. And the EU is accused of turning a blind eye to abuses because Greece is keeping migrants out. Some boats from the EU's own border agency are even accused of helping with pushbacks. But now a top EU official has told the BBC pushbacks defy its core values and must stop. Uh, I think these are violations of uh, our fundamental European values. And when we are protecting our borders, we are protecting our values. And that's why we can't see um, violations of fundamental rights going on without having a proper response to that. But this evening, Athens hit back. Allegations affecting Greece are clearly unfounded rely on footage or testimonials provided for from the country of departure. Numerous cases have been investigated, including by the European Union, and reports have found no evidence of any breach of EU fundamental rights. That denial will be challenged if the EU is serious about ending abuses on its borders. Let's get ahead of the latest sports news. Here's Catherine Murphy. France has secured a thrilling 28-26 test victory over the Wallabies in front of 20,000 fans in Melbourne. The Wallabies, who trailed by 11 points with 10 minutes remaining, took a late lead thanks to a try by skipper Michael Hooper and a Noah Lelesio penalty. However, with just two minutes remaining, Melvin Jaminet converted another penalty to keep the series alive ahead of the decider. It's a short turnaround to the next match in just four days' time. No question our guys fight, that's for sure. Um, we wanted a fast start tonight. We're denied that by the French. Hey, like They came out, they were really all over our breakdown throughout the, the majority of the game. Uh, we turned over way too much ball. Across the park, they're really good, um, you know, getting the ball back and, and then putting us under pressure. They played a really good French game tonight, you know, taking points, building pressure. So we had to start going to line, you know, and trying to get, uh, get a few tries on the board. But, um, you know, credit to them and um, we've got to get going for Saturday. Roger Federer has withdrawn from the Olympics, saying he suffered a setback with his knee during Wimbledon. The 39-year-old has never won an Olympic gold medal in singles at the Games and had made no secret of his desire to do so. Federer lost in straight sets in Wimbledon in the quarterfinal to Poland's Hubert Hurikacz. The 20-time Grand Slam champion says he hopes to return to the Tour later this year. The Blues and the Maroons will tonight face off in the third game of State of Origin on the Gold Coast after the dead rubber was moved again. The Blues are looking to complete a clean sweep after a 44-point win and a 26-point thrashing despite both fixtures being held in Queensland. In case you were wondering, the cumulative point score is 76-6 in favour of New South Wales. Queensland's COVID situation means there will be be a capacity crowd of 27,000 allowed at Rubina. Now with the national weather forecast, here's Nate Byrne. A front that weakened to a trough over South Australia yesterday is now shifted into the eastern suburbs and it's bringing plenty of wet weather with it, as well as some pretty windy conditions over the ranges in the south of New South Wales and northeastern Victoria. In fact, warnings out for damaging winds, potentially gusting as strong as 125 kilometres an hour over the Alpine peaks. It's not likely to ease until tomorrow. Plenty of wet weather through the south, not only associated with the system and that trough, but then also the winds behind it will carry more force 
falls into South Australia. WA also still copying some wet weather as another trough makes an approach to the southwest, and that'll bring another burst of storm activity tonight. Now, this system is helping to open the doorway for the southeast of the country for more fronts. And late Friday into Saturday, we'll see a particularly strong one bringing some pretty strong winds and lots of rain to parts of South Australia. The range is really copying it over the next week or so. I'm also keeping my eye on the west for next week because we've got a source of tropical moisture moving down and that's likely to gen generate some wet weather as we get into next week as well. For your Thursday, it's going to be another fine day for Brisbane getting to 25. Clear skies in Sydney as well, 21 the top there. But then after that, some wet weather for the rest of the south. Showers in Canberra, 13 the maximum. 17 in Melbourne with a shower or two. Hobart's expecting some light rain at times. It'll get to 14. Showers increasing again for Adelaide, 17 the top, whereas the showers are easing for Perth, 18 for you, whereas up north Darwin, you're staying sunny. It's getting to 32. The top stories here on ABC News. Greater Sydney's lockdown has been extended by two weeks until the end of the month as New South Wales records another 97 new cases of COVID-19. Victoria has recorded another seven cases linked to COVID-infected removalists who travelled to the state from New South Wales. The Australian Defence Force is tracking a high-tech Chinese surveillance ship making its way to Queensland ahead of large-scale international military exercises. And a new appeal for information to help find the remains of murdered backpacker Peter Falconio on the 20th anniversary of his death. Well, 18 months into this pandemic and North Korea is still proudly proclaiming it remains COVID free. It also remains vaccine free and seemingly has no plan for gaining access to them. North Korea's defence against an outbreak could be dependent on what happens across the border in the south. Seoul correspondent Carrington Clark reports. South Korean pharmaceutical companies are racing to produce homegrown COVID-19 vaccines. Hopefully, we're going to get the vaccines ready by the end of this year or early next year. South Korea already provides vaccines for developing countries. These cholera vaccines are heading to Ethiopia. But it doesn't supply them directly to its nuclear-armed neighbour, and many believe the North needs protection against COVID-19. It is just subject to the Korean government, but if there is, as long as there is a demand, then we are ready for the supply. The South Korean government would like to uh, give vaccines uh, as a diplomatic uh, card, uh, chip, uh, to, uh, to, dealing, to deal with the North Korea. North Korea claims its strict borders have kept COVID-19 out of the country, but those same border controls have cut off access to fertiliser and fuel needed for agriculture. Uh, food supply, as uh, Chairman Kim mentioned, uh, will be in crisis in near short term. Dictator Kim Jong-un is facing the worst crisis in his near decade-long reign. He knows North Korea's malnourished population and decrepit health system would not cope with an outbreak of COVID-19. He has no plan to vaccinate his people, but he knows North Korea cannot stay cut off from the world forever. A single case of the virus could see it spread to the whole of North Korea in less than a month. North Korean defector Kang Mi Jin is now safely south of the border and enjoying her freedom. She says people in the north would welcome South Korean vaccines. Ordinary people believe products made in South Korea are the best quality. The UN, Russia and China all say they're willing to provide vaccines to North Korea, but those offers haven't been accepted. With the Delta variant on North Korea's doorstep driving a dangerous fourth wave in Seoul, Kim Jong-un knows there's not much time to protect his people. Carrington Clark, ABC News, Seoul. A second disaster and emergency response team from Australia will head to Fiji today to help with its escalating COVID-19 crisis. The 17-member cohort is made up of 10 personnel from the Darwin-based National Critical Care and Trauma Response Centre, known as OSMAT, with another seven from New Zealand. Three fully equipped ambulances will also be provided, along with oxygen equipment, stretcher beds, PPE and 390,000 vaccine doses. Fiji recorded 873 new COVID cases yesterday and three more deaths, including a 15-year-old girl. 
Indonesia has overtaken India as the Asian epicentre for the pandemic, with daily infections exceeding 40,000 for two straight days. 864 deaths were recorded just yesterday. The highly contagious Delta variant has stretched parts of the health system to breaking point. Hospitals are reporting critical shortages of oxygen, personal protective equipment and other vital supplies. The US is sending 3 million doses of the Moderna vaccine to the Southeast Asian nation this week to provide third booster shots to healthcare workers. In the US, fire crews are continuing to battle dozens of blazes burning across several western states that are threatening hundreds of properties and forcing thousands of people from their homes. The largest is in Oregon and it remains out of control, disrupting power transmission lines to California. The fires erupted as the western region of the United States was in the grip of the second bout of dangerously high temperatures. Scientists say a climate change fueled so-called mega drought is also contributing to the severe conditions. A man has died and several others have been injured during a protest in Cuba. Authorities say demonstrators tried to attack officials, damage infrastructure and reach a police station in suburban Havana. Unrest in communist-run Cuba erupted on the weekend with protests nationwide. Thousands of people have taken to the streets shouting freedom and down with the dictatorship. Closer to home now and it's a murder that captivated the nation and made the victims and perpetrator household names. In the two decades since Bradley John Murdoch attacked Peter Falconio and Joanne Lees in the Australian outback, one mystery remains. On the anniversary of Mr Falconio's death, police are renewing calls for information to help find his body. For more, I spoke to reporter Mitchell Abram, who was reporting from along the Stewart Highway, about 300 kilometres north of Alice Springs. The question that police are trying to answer to this day is where? Uh, so, as you mentioned, we're 300 kilometres north of Alice Springs along the Stewart Highway, about 15 kilometres north of Barrow Creek, and it is on this stretch of highway 20 years ago that uh, Peter Falconio and Joanne Lees were attacked. What we know is that this is where Peter Falconio was murdered and Joanne Lees was briefly kidnapped before she managed to escape. In 2005, Bradley John Murdoch was convicted with the murder of Peter Falconio and the kidnapping of Joanne Lees. What we don't don't know is what Bradley John Murdoch did with Peter Falconio's body. We know from here he went to Alice Springs to refuel and then went back up the Stewart Highway and across to Broome in Western Australia and it's in that journey back to Alice Springs that authorities believe that's where he buried Peter Falconio's body but as you can see uh, this part of the territory is very remote, 300 kilometres north of Alice Springs. The next uh, roadhouse is about 90 kilometres north of us so there's a lot of nothing out here so the the question of where Peter Falconio could be buried is a very, very difficult question to answer, one that police haven't been able to answer in 20 years and obviously that's why they've come out with this renewed push for information to try and answer that question and get some closure for everyone that's been involved in this case over the years. Mitchell, this was such a high profile case two decades ago. How are people feeling in the area after all this time? Well, you mentioned that Peter Falconio and Bradley John Murdoch are, are household names because of this case. And 20 years on, they're, they're just as well known as ever. You know, children who've grown up in the Territory have heard this case as they've grown up. You know, they've heard about Barrow Creek. They've heard Peter Falconio. They've heard Joanne Lees. They've heard Bradley John Murdoch. Uh, I mentioned the Barrow Creek Roadhouse before. That was uh, one of the locations that uh, Joanne Lees was taken after she was rescued after the incident. And it's frankly something that they'd rather forget. Um, obviously, there is uh, a level of infamy that that's come with being so closely linked to this case, but something that they'd rather forget. Um, but like I said, the, the question of where Peter Falconio's body lives on, and I think as long as that question lives on, there is going to be a level of intrigue in this case. You know, questions about whether we will ever get an answer to that question. And I think as long as that question remains unanswered, Barrow Creek is going to remain a, a household name for people as well as people remember what happened here 20 years ago. Mitchell Abram reporting there from the Territory. Now, coming up next hour is Afternoon Briefing with Patricia Carvelis. PK, I had to check the date today because we've got a city in lockdown and we've got a state government at war with the federal government. I just wanted to check that we weren't still in 2020. It seems like it's all kicking off once more about who's footing the bill for these coronavirus lockdowns. 
Yeah, Matt Doran, the sort of feeling of deja vu that you're feeling is uh, because we are repeating history and that's what we're doing in 2021. And so we've got this situation where Victoria is very, very angry with the federal government. The federal government counters that anger by saying, you know, we treated you the same, that's not true, look how much we spent on your long lockdown last year. But either way, the optics of the way that the Prime Minister stood next to the New South Wales Treasurer and the New South Wales Premier yesterday to announce this financial support package for New South Wales, that is enduring a, a longer lockdown now, the extension of two weeks today, and it could go beyond that uh, if you look at the numbers that, that and, and the Delta variant. Uh, clearly, that the emotions are high, and there's a lot of politics in all of this as well. You know this, Matt Doran. We've got a federal election coming up, and uh, the the kind of political debate around setting up Vic Victoria setting itself up as a state that's been neglected by the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, that's being politically uh, really shoved uh, to the corner, the second biggest state in the country that's endured so much during this pandemic. Well, I think that's going to resonate. This afternoon on Afternoon Briefing, I'm actually going to be joined by the New South Wales opposition leader, Chris Minns. I'd love to hear whether he thinks the Prime Minister is the Prime Minister for New South Wales, which is um, the way that Dan Andrews, the Victorian Premier, described him. We're also going to be speaking to the ACTU's Michelle O'Neill. Now, I really want to get from her what she makes of uh, the essential worker definition or the lack of definition, whether this new support package will allow people who who don't want to go to work because they don't, you know, they want to follow health orders, but they have to make that choice themselves, it seems, because of the lack of definition, whether that's adequate and whether there are enough safeguards around that. And also my political panel too, to thrash out all these issues and to look at whether this kind of state um, and federal blame game, which we see, will just continue and we know that Australians are pretty sick of it actually they just want people to get their leaders to get on with it and actually you know suppress the virus get them vaccinated and get them back to work the joys of the federation pk looking forward to it we'll catch you after 4、well, in the uk there are growing calls for tech giants to hand over the details of people who've racially targeted three of England's star soccer players. People are police are investigating the online vitriol directed at the players who all missed crucial penalty kicks in the European Championship final. Europe correspondent Samantha Hawley reports from London. In Manchester, they came to right a wrong. Placing thousands of messages of support on a mural of English soccer star Marcus Rashford. You look around you, there's black people there, there's white people, there's Asian people, and I love seeing that. The painting was repaired after being vandalised after England's Euro final loss. Oh, he's missed it. Rashford, along with Jaden Sancho and Bukayo Saka, missed penalty kicks in Sunday's match. And have since been racially vilified across social media. The moment that I saw that three young black England players had missed their penalties, I knew what was coming next was a racist backlash. Paul Cannaville was Chelsea Football Club's first black player. I pulled and just the feeling that, of course, what more can we have, do we have to do? This has happened far too long, and the social media need to get on top of it. You've got to be now supporting the backs of the young black players. Boris Johnson has hauled in the big tech companies, demanding they do more to counter racism on social media. But many ministers here want more, demanding they release the offenders' details so they can be named and shamed. Absolutely, we need to name and shame those who feel that it's appropriate and that they can get away with.、Um, Using horrific language. Tech companies、um, have long been recognised for allowing such kind of racism to flare up. The police are investigating, and one man's been arrested. But with the offenders hiding behind the social media wall, they'll need the tech giants to play ball. Samantha Hawley, ABC News, London. 
Change of pace now and it's shaping up to be another good year for Australian sheep farmers. The price of lamb is heading towards record levels, but what's good for farmers might be hard to swallow for consumers. Here's rural reporter Luke Radford. The price of lamb is once again off and running. For the third year in a row, Australian lamb is attracting a premium price and there's no sign of it slowing down. Normally the, the peak in price comes late winter, so we still may get prices into that kind of low to mid 900 cent level uh, later this you know, next few months. Market analyst Matt Dowgleish says the perfect storm has been brewing for years. Over the last probably decade or so, we've seen really good growth in export markets for lamb uh, as, a, as a meat product. Uh, so that's been underpinning really strong sale yard prices probably for the last five to six years. Those price increases have also broken a 40-year record. It's currently about $165 for a 20 kilo lamb. While the price of lamb is up, the price of mutton is also riding high. In fact, it's just 30 cents short of breaking the all-time Australian price record. That's good news for farmers like Scott Colvin, who produces up to 14,000 lambs a year. Lamb is unbelievably uh, good. It has been strong for a number of years. We've increased our trading operation basically from, from zero through to we trade about seven or 8,000 lambs a year on top of what we breed. While great for farmers, it's pricey for consumers. I reckon it's probably gone up a third. It's more loin chops. Um, they go for little smaller roasts, like top side roast, um, silver side roast. Sage advice for a cheaper Sunday roast. Luke Radford, ABC News. Well, let's go from the lamb markets to the rest of your business news. Here's Alicia Barry. Competition is heating up in the buy now, pay later sector. US payment giant PayPal is taking on Australia's pioneer of the uh, buy now, pay later sector, Afterpay, at its own game. It's launched a pay in four option for its nine million Australian customers. The same format as Afterpay, but without the late fees. Afterpay made almost $70 million in late fees last year. PayPal will also charge merchants slightly less than Afterpay. Meanwhile, Apple is also reportedly working on a new service that will let consumers pay for any Apple Pay purchase in instalments over time. Afterpay and small arrival Zip are among the worst performers on the share market today. Consumer confidence in New South Wales has been crushed by the capital's lockdown, according to the latest survey from Westpac and the Melbourne Institute. But surging optimism among Victorians and Western Australians helped lift the overall mood. The survey, conducted in the week beginning July 5th, showed a 1.5% rebound in national confidence despite a 10% drop in New South Wales. But Westpac is warning confidence in Sydney and New South Wales could fall significantly further if the extended lockdown measures are unsuccessful. Across industry groups, tradies are happy to be benefiting from renovation and construction activity and consumers working in hospitality and recreational services were the most pessimistic. Stick. The energy market operator is outlining a significant shift in Australia's approach to renewables. The new head of the energy market operator is planning for the grid to handle 100% renewable energy by 2025. With the huge growth in renewables, Daniel Westerman says Australia needs to be able to harness solar and wind generators when both are running at capacity. Interestingly though, the operator has also backed the Snowy Hydro's controversial new gas plant, saying it will play a vital role in the nation's energy mix. Alicia Barry there. Now, Carlos Ghosn, the former boss of the car-making giant Nissan, has been describing how he fled house arrest in Japan three years ago by hiding in a box that was loaded onto a private jet. He'd been arrested in Tokyo and charged with financial misconduct offences. Now in exile in Lebanon, Mr Ghosn denies the charges and says he believes he's being treated as collateral damage. From folk hero to fugitive, Carlos Ghosn was a rock star of the business world. At one time, the boss of Renault, Nissan and a giant manufacturing alliance that included Mitsubishi. Mingling with heads of state, his image was found in the society pages in France and comics in Japan. Citizen of the world with homes across the globe. But that opulent lifestyle came to an abrupt halt when he landed in Japan in November 2018 for what he thought was a routine work meeting. 
It was a normal day, normal arrival. The policeman at the passport control said there was a problem. The only memory I have of this moment is shock, frozen trauma. He was taken to a detention centre, watch, phone, computer confiscated, handed the clothes of a prisoner. For the next year, he was either in prison, under house arrest, or followed wherever he went. Japan has a 99% conviction rate, and when he was told he could have no contact with his wife, he made a big decision. If I want to have any hope to have one day a normal life, I'm going to have to leave. But how? Two former soldiers posing as musicians arrived in Japan to smuggle him out in a music equipment box like this. When you get in the box, you don't think about the past, you don't think about the future, you just think about the moment, because you don't see anything, you just can hear people around you. And these 30 minutes waiting in the box, in the plane, waiting for the plane to take off, were probably the, 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 the longest period of wait I've ever experienced in my life. But why did Nissan, the Japanese company he was credited with saving, suddenly turn on him? He insists it was Japanese fears that French company Renault, which already owns nearly half of Nissan, wanted control. They turned on me because they were very upset uh, by the behaviour of the French state. So you are saying you were collateral damage? I, I am saying that. Do you have, then, no regrets about your own behavior? Nobody can say, you know, I spent 19 years heading a company and, uh, you know, there is nothing I could not have done differently. This being said, uh, the action and the reaction, both in Japan and France, has been totally disproportionate, totally irrational. Meanwhile, this man, Greg Kelly, colleague and confidant of Carlos Ghosn, is still detained in Japan, along with two Americans who masterminded his astonishing escape. You got out. How do you feel about... Do you have any regrets about the people that are still there? Because of you, facing jail time. I feel sorry for all the people who are victim of the hostage justice system in Japan. Japanese government and Nissan officials deny he's been treated unfairly. This one-time big fish now swims in a smaller pond, in exile under armed guard in Beirut. Not the retirement Carlos Ghosn was expecting. Australian scientists have developed the world's first needle-free diabetes test, and it's expected to be available within just two years. Professor Paul Dastour from Newcastle University says the kit gives scientists the chance to forever change the daily routines of those living with the illness. The ability to print uh, strips of um, printed electronic sensors that can detect glucose at very low concentrations. In fact, at the concentrations that are present in your saliva rather than your blood. The glucose in your uh, saliva follows that in your blood, uh, but it's just at about a concentration of around 100 times less. And so these sensors allow us to detect glucose at those very low concentrations. One of, the, one of the huge issues, obviously, uh, for diabetes sufferers is the fact that they have to um, do a, a blood test uh, four to ten times a day. It's painful and it's invasive. What we've developed is the ability to manufacture, at really low cost, a sensor that you'll be able to use your saliva for, thus eliminating that pain and hopefully producing much better health outcomes for diabetes patients. What we just announced is that the federal government has uh, provided funding for us to establish the first manufacturing plant, the first factory, for these sensors here in Newcastle, which is really exciting. We estimate it's going to take about 18 months to build that factory, with probably the first devices on the shelves within about two years. We're currently pursuing regulatory approvals um, in the US with FDA, and also subsequently in the region, um, in Asia, Pacific and China. One man has been killed and dozens of people arrested in Cuba after the biggest protests in years against the communist government. Cuba's going through its worst economic crisis in decades and the country's facing a resurgence of coronavirus cases. Associate Professor Dario Marino from Florida International University says the protests come at a vulnerable time for the Cuban regime. They're um, important because they're nationwide. Uh, they seem pretty well organized, and these uh, rose out of the San Isidro movement, which was led by artists, writers, and journalists. And it's significant because 
uh, the Castro brothers, who have controlled the island for near over 60 years, are no longer there. And Miguel Diaz Canal, the current president, does not have the charisma or the power or the um, credibility of Fidel and Raul, who uh, were present at the creation of communist Cuba. And it's also a mark of their desperation. I mean, Cuba has gone through a, uh, earlier this year, they uh, had a currency reform, which has led to uh, inflation. Uh, there is very little hope in improving the economy. In 2016, when President Obama visited Cuba, there was great hope that the embargo was going to be lifted and the economy was going to be improved. But the uh, communist Cuban government uh, messed it up with the sonic attacks on American diplomatic personnel, which caused um, severe distress to some diplomats and even a small infant child, a dependent to one of the diplomats, who apparently suffered some brain damage and, there is our, and they have resulted in some lawsuits. And the Cuban government uh, dismissed this as cricket. So, they, uh, so when Trump came in, there was a, uh, a, a return to a very hard-line American policy. And this has added to kind of this feeling of hopelessness. They're going to go for repression, but they have, you know, few arrows in the quiver. Um, there's very little they can do economically immediately to improve the situation. Their big banner factors recently has been Venezuela, which is going through its own economic uh, difficulties. Uh, the, corvon the, the coronavirus has added to this sense of desperation and hopelessness. And um, so their only choice is repression, uh, 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 the use of uh, law enforcement. But where does that get them at the end of the day? Uh, another tactic might be create another migration crisis like they did in 1980 and 1993. Um, but those are... Um, those are very few arrows. I think this is significant. I think also it's going to be interesting to watch whether Miguel Diaz Canard can survive this. Uh, Fidel Castro, uh, Raul Castro attended the Politburo meeting yesterday, um, and he's retired. So that shows some level of concerns from the Castro family. And so you might have a change in leadership in the Communist Party to someone that has greater credibility and maybe even a firmer hand. And staying overseas, more than 70 people have died in South Africa after rioting descended into the worst violence the country has seen for years. In Durban, a baby was thrown from a building that had been set on fire. The baby was caught safely and reunited with her mother. More than 200 shopping malls have been looted and many others have shut their doors. I just want to bring you some breaking news now out of WA. And as a result of the new local cases of COVID-19 recorded in Victoria, WA has now reclassified the state as a low-risk jurisdiction. All recent arrivals from Victoria should monitor for symptoms and present for testing immediately if any develop. And we'll have more on that story throughout the afternoon. But for now, though, that is the very latest here on ABC News. I'm Matthew Doran. Thank you for your company. Do stay with us. Patricia Carvelis is up next with Afternoon Briefing. Her guests, the ACT. EU President Michelle O'Neill and the New South Wales Labor leader Chris Minns. Bye for now. Tonight.